Welcome back to another episode of Out of Blank Podcast. Greg, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Always good to see you. Hey, we're both rocking button-ups. We did not plan that, just so everybody knows. <laughs> we did not, know. Definitely not. Um, you wanted to talk about RFK today, I understand. Yeah, I don't know if you really looked into it a whole lot, but after learning a lot about the JFK assassination and then obviously kind of the RFK K assassination comes with the territory as well too and then after paul schrade recently passing away um i realized i might not have the opportunity to speak to people who were actually either there or had done maybe work on it because everyone's getting older and i'm coming to the game a little bit late so if I, you mentioned that you looked a little bit into the rfk stuff so i'm curious um it was that because of the J jfk stuff or did you just come across it was, it, was, it was in uh the early stages of writing my book on oswald believe it or not I was looking for um, for precedent or potentially precedent cases of uh, of taxis being used in, in assassinations and, and came across uh, one that I hadn't heard of before in uh, in Colombia in, in South America. Um, it happens roughly twenty or you know, almost twenty years to the date of um, of RFK's assassination. The victim uh, in this case was a guy called. Jorge Gaetan, uh, and again, forgive me if that pronunciation is incorrect, but um, I, I think the name uh, might be familiar to some and not, not, not others. Uh, Gaetan was, was regarded in Colombia as their own JFK um, because he was a young, uh, a, a young uh, liberal on the rise, um, had a lot of charisma, Etc. So they naturally, and, and plus he got assassinated. So those things made him made uh, the locals compare him to to JFK. But the better comparison is really RFK. Uh, he was never elected as president. He he was on the campaign trail, like RFK was, uh, and he was also killed in close range uh, by a young man with a, or allegedly by a young man with a with a pistol. Um, in front of a, a large crowd. So those comparisons are, are quite obviously and very starkly comparable to RFK rather than JFK. Um, now, you said allegedly. Is that because that it was never – like, was he killed after the shooting happened and everything? or was Yeah. He yeah, what, what happened was um, he, uh, another witness said that a tall, relatively well-dressed – a uh, guy started yell who was standing close to the alleged ass assassin. Uh, he started yelling for um, the crowd to grab him. He'd been he'd been detained by police and taken to a to a pharmacy for protection, and they closed the iron gate door to try and protect him from the mob. This guy sort of stirred the stirred the mob into breaking the door down, grabbing him. They beat him to death and dragged him through the streets. That preceded um, many nights of absolute violence in, in the city, and another ten years or so of violence uh, countrywide. Um, it was quite a big thing at the time. Um, the the comparisons to uh, the RFK case don't stop there. The par comparisons also uh, relate to the alleged perpetrator. He, his name was uh, Juan Roa Sierra. Um, he was a young guy like, like Saran, about you know, early 20s. Uh, he was from a large impoverished family, a uh, single mother. Um, he drifted in and out of work and he became interested in the occult, just like, uh, just like uh, Saran did. Wait, so Sirhan's interested in the occult? I, I've only heard people defend Sirhan. I think I've only heard one person um, say that they think Sirhan was a part of it because you can't really explain the gun thing. Like I said, I'm new to the RFK assassination. If at some point we'll drift into the JFK stuff, well, I'll sound a little bit more intelligent. Uh, but when it comes to the occult stuff, I didn't know Sirhan was even interested in the occult. Yeah, that was a big part of his life. He was a, a young idealist looking for answers to the world. Um, and that's why he probably had been uh, drifting from job to job. He was you know, a young guy in search of himself, basically, and he thought he could find those answers in, uh, you know, way out religions that were happening 
uh, at that time in in uh, California. There was no shortage. I mean, the, the cult in the fifties and sixties, the cult in America was huge, uh, and, there, and there was not, nothing considered too way out about it, especially in places like California. Um, but one of the main ones was was, was the Rosicrucians, uh, a, a group called AMORC, uh, A M O R C, which was an acronym uh, for some Latin phrase, um, and uh, they ran advertisements constantly to, to lure young people in, and one of those people was uh, was Sharan, and also. 20 years earlier, because uh, they advertised in foreign countries, uh, you can join by by letter and become a member of the California cult, even though you didn't live in America. So that's what uh, Saran did while he was living in California, and that's what Juan Raul Sierra did 20 years earlier in uh, in Bogota, in Colombia. Um, and what they what they did with with uh, one role of Sierra was to write to him, sending him instructions on because when you start out in those sort of uh, cults, you're you're a, uh, a, uh, I think they call it a, a novia or, or you're the lowest level anyway, and, and you've got to go through. <clears throat> so a no, yeah, a novice, yeah, yeah, basically another word for a novice. Um, you've got to go through certain levels to to get up. To the top, much like uh, Scientology and all those now, um, and part of that is, is to uh, train yourself in, in certain um, certain disciplines like self hypnosis, uh, and to perform all these rituals. And the objective, eventually, is to get to a stage where uh, you can control. Uh, other things, other people, other events with the power of your mind. I know a little That's bit about uh, Sir Hans. I guess he was easily hypnosable, which is weird. I've never come across like an actual diagnosis of someone saying like, yeah, this guy is easily susceptible to hypnotism. But Sir Han, I've heard that before, that he was um, susceptible to hypnotism. Yeah. Th I mean, most people believe that uh, the CIA used one of their uh, assets in the medical field to to hypnotise him and, and put put him under uh, you know, programming him basically while he was while he was under hypnosis. I I dissent from that view in that I, I believe that both he and twenty years earlier Juan Raul Sierra hypnotised themselves under instructions from this cult. Okay, and um, what in the case of uh, Juan Raul Sierra, part of the hypnosis was, was he was to get a mirror, light a candle, stare into the mirror until he saw someone emerging from it. And that would be his, like, spirit guide or whatever, you know, whatever bullshit they were feeding him. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I'm with you on that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean, the, the people in that place and, and time were, especially in Latin America, were probably very highly superstitious people to start with. So, um, but anyway, what, this particular uh, process was he had to stare in the mirror, light a candle, put himself, repeat phrases to put himself under hypnosis, and stare in the mirror and see who emerged. Now, who he claimed he saw emerging. Uh, was the a guy called Santador or Santador? Um, going from memory here, but he was one of the um, he was one of the founders of Colombia, and he was also uh, he was a co-founder, and he was a, uh, he was arrested at one stage as being one of the plotters in a plot against the other guy that co-founded Colombia. Um, if that makes sense. And so they're already setting him up to believe that he was uh, had the spirit of a potential assassin 
helping him out sort of thing. What I believe they actually did was while he was under hypnosis, uh, a guy entered the room, a wild-looking guy who was, you know, apparently had wild hair or whatever, and so as they did in, in, back in the days of Shantadar. And um, I think a guy has entered the room so that his reflection was in the mirror. One row in his stupor, uh, self-imposed self stupor, saw the image of this guy and, and, and thought, okay, well, that's, that's what I'm seeing coming at me. That's, you know, that, that's who I've got to be like, you know, that's, I've got to, I've got to uh, be like that guy. Um, but they were all already implanting in his mind that, that he was going to be a saviour of Colombia by being an assassin, by 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 doing this thing with, with Santadar. Um, he started carrying a, a, a drawing of Santadar around with him. He started telling friends and, and family that he was going to be a great uh, magician. Um, he started seeing a, a German palmist um, who's an interesting guy in, in himself, the palmist, um, I during, during World War II, uh, Colombia and, and most other uh, South American countries rounded up all the Germans uh, that were in business mainly or uh, had, a, had some power or sway in the German community. That was during the war, so that they could uh, send money back to Germany to help the Axis Axis people. So they were they were either shipped back to Germany or, or taken to um, the US and put up in in camps in, in the US. Now the ones they left behind, uh, the ones they didn't take, uh, were left behind to be informants for the Americans. So my belief is that this German palmist was in fact working for the Americans as an informant or in some other capacity. Uh, and so one way else where Sierra started seeing this guy, after the assassination, uh, one of the investigators interviewed the palmist, and the palmist apparently had told Juan Warrell Sierra that he was uh, that he was going to be a mechanic. Um, that was his calling, a mechanic, which I don't know how familiar you are with CIA terminology, but that, that's the term for a hitman. I didn't know that, but I was about to say, if you're getting a palm reading and the guy tells you in your future all you're going to be is a mechanic, I'd be pretty fucking pissed. Well, it was a lot better than what he was, which was a, uh, probably had his hand out for, <laughs> you know, in spare a dollar sort of thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> when, it, well, uh, when it comes to uh, Sirhan, I mean, the... With the the occult stuff, you don't think that it's a military industrial complex thing? I mean, it's hard because if you look from like I'm only pulling stuff from like the JFK stuff where there's similarities. I'm trying to find parallels. I mean, I do believe obviously military industrial complex on the JFK one because of the, the cover up stuff. But maybe you can say rogue elements, sure. But when you come to the RFK case, it's just it's like the same thing that it's like a patsy. It's another one of this. I don't know if this is just a method of political assassinations. And I usually, I would think that the patsy doesn't get to live. You know, you don't try and arrest the patsy. It would be a dumb thing if he could talk later. Well, what, what happened was that um, in the, in the Bogota case, uh, one row Sierra had been hanging around with another guy and trying to see uh, Jorge Gaitan uh, in his office. Um, in the weeks leading up to the assassination, and he was with him again this day. He was the one that actually got the crowd to uh, to take uh, Juan Raul Sierra off the police and, and beat him to death before he disappeared in a new car. Now he was seen during the assassination. He was seen with a coat folded over his arm. Okay, I don't think either Saran or uh, one row Sierra could hit the side of the bar door uh, with, with a gun, but I do believe they fired shots. Okay, in, in this case, there were four shots fired. There were three quick shots in succession, a gap, and then, and then a line one that missed. I believe that was the only shot that, that, that one row Sierra fired was the one that missed the, the fourth one. The first three, I believe, was, was by this guy 
uh, with the coat folded over his jacket with a gun. He, I believe there was a gun inside there, and he's the one that uh, he's the one that did the deed, and he escaped in a brand new car. Um, after afterwards, uh, when everyone was talking about this guy that could have been an associate of Juan Rao Sierra, that they the press. Uh, nicknamed him the, the man with wild eyes or something like that, whatever the Spanish term Similar for that is. Similar to the woman in the polka dot dress, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly, yeah. I'm seeing the similarities. I know a little bit about the RFK case. Um, there's just a lot of, like, confusion. Like, I, I obviously, I see more parallels with the JFK one just because I know that one. I don't know about the one you're talking about. Yeah. Well... Again, I, the, the, the parallels with the JFK case come more in regard to the following uh, investigations of them. They're both both cover-ups. Cover what they did was the government uh, itself in Bogota uh, investigated the, the, the case, found that Juan Rao Sierra acted alone. No one was happy with that because you had the Americans and, and certain right-wing press down there saying the commies were behind it. Uh, you had others saying that the right-wing, you know, conservative side was behind it. Uh, so the government had no choice. They they did, they pulled the Warren Commission type thing, except instead of getting uh, a, a Warren Commission together like they did with JFK, what they did was they called over some detectives from Scotland Yard and got them to act as the sort of a Warren Commission in that they were not to do an investigation of their own, but to review the government's case. Uh, they were not to request any further documents. Whatever was used in that original investigation was all they could use in their own review of that case. And so they had no choice. They had to find, uh, once again, the, the, because they couldn't do any further investigation, they had to find that their original case was was got it right, which you know, yeah, 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 yeah. That's um, I mean, I I think there were some lessons learned off that, possibly for the way they did it with the JFK case, as far as investigating goes, but the 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 actual crime itself and the person that was killed. That's just a carbon copy of, of RFK right through from from the alleged assassin to, to the to the victim himself. It's just a carbon copy. So do you um, do you believe Sirhan fired or you believe he fired shots, but do you, you don't believe he was the only shooter, do you? No, no, no. I, I and I wouldn't it's possible he some of his shots hit hit targets, but yeah, I don't believe he I believe there was another shooter there. Whether it was Caesar. The, the, the guard that everyone points to, or someone else I don't know, but um, I there was something that triggered him to, to, to act the way he did, uh, whether it was the girl in the polka dot dress, whether uh, it was the drinks he had or or, um, or some other sign or, or word was used to trigger him, but something triggered him to, to do what he did. Just hearing the story, if you're part of the public, the hypnosis thing sounds so weird. But if you know about like MK Ultra and stuff that the governments and these and now what you're mentioning with your example, there's a lot of like more weight I would put into that. Like there's you can't explain how like when he's grabbed by his hand, Sirhan, and then he's still firing shots and he, they're banging it on the table. He's still firing shots. It's like that's not a sign of someone who's full concentrated on what they're doing that's someone who's either like a manic state or something because usually you would stop and point at the person who's pressing you up against the wall and shoot him but then i've heard that like there was a diary that said rfk must die written multiple times all over it and i'm just like i have no i mean it doesn't look good if someone planted that on them or something but that's definitely would be in line more with an occult thing not a cia thing well that was all part of his training with the aim, aim book was that was that's automatic writing. That's an example of automatic writing. You've got to um and he probably did that under instruction either from himself under self-hypnosis or he's put himself under and someone else has come in and instructed him to, to write that. Uh, 
but um, yeah, I, I I would completely ignore that writing as an indicator of uh, of intent. I think it, I think it was built up to that stage through the process of his indoctrination into this occult. Um, and it's possible it wasn't even really representative of the, of the occult doing this, but some other, you know, someone pretending to be from, from AMOC or whatever. I, I, I'm, I don't pretend to know all, all the answers to it, but I do know that uh, self-hypnosis was part of his training, and I don't believe anyone else was hypnosis, hypnotizing him. Uh, and yes, he was susceptible to hypnosis, uh, as was Raoul would have been. But I think part of that was, was their uh, was their ethnic background and upbringing, uh, their environment. Uh, as I said, deeply deeply uh, religious and deeply uh, superstitious uh, peoples are, are the type that are more susceptible to that because they they believe to start with. They they they, they want that to happen. They want you know as part of their mindset. So when it comes to Sirhan and it comes to the whole RFK case, I mean, do you, th when you, obviously we talk about second shooters, but when you look at like the evidence of the whole thing, the magic bullet that seems like to be in this case as well too, I mean, the amount of evidence that goes missing, kind of, a lot of parallels with the JFK thing. Do you think this is like a template of like how things get done. It always has to be like this lone assassin, no conspiracy aspect to it. I mean, conspiracy is not bad. If you talk about more than one person was involved, that's not bad. I think the way the language has been morphed now, but with the whole case, I mean, I'm starting to look at this like this is all a lot of like methods of political assassinations now, and it's a really smart one. It seems like they've just been fine tuning over the years. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do believe there are probably a, a few templates of, out there of uh, of how this could be done, and, and this particular one was chosen for RFK. Um, when I when I first started writing the book, I was told to look at uh, more well known assassinations, and I didn't want to do that because they've already been written about in relation to the JFK assassination. So I was looking for for, for other ones that that uh, were possibly less known, but even even more um, similar in terms of how they played out. Uh, the the others were in, in regard to coups, uh, so uh, and that's that's I guess a lot of the idea of people calling the JFK assassination a, a coup as well because they they their precedents that they're looking at were actual proper coups in in, in mainly in uh, Latin America. Plus, with, with the RFK case is different than the Oswald scenario because our Sirhan still lived. And I just think it was easier to steamroll him over because he was not like, you know, white American, that type. He was kind of a, a foreign person. So they decided to steamroll him. And that's how like everyone just completely ignored the fact. Like they figured like he has less rights or something like that. Seems like. Yeah, I, I think you're uh, probably right there. Um, I think uh, minorities are often a target of, of uh, even if you drill down into uh, police, just everyday crime, uh, minorities are targeted. So, you know, because they're easy to steamroll. Now, when it comes to um, just political assassinations in general, even in other countries, I mean, the one you mentioned, the example you gave, the one 28 years pr prior before the RFK one, now, is it, I mean, is this a common thing that you're able to like find? Like, I only know about a couple of political assassinations like RFK, JFK, but are you able to find others around other countries where it seems like every government kind of has their own method of getting rid of someone or getting someone out of power? And usually they use the same like lone assassin method. Yeah, there's, uh, I have found other examples in, in Mexico, uh, in the Middle East, uh, Africa, all over the place. Um, because you got to think about it. if you're using mind control or something like that, it's like a government tactic. The occult is a great way to have like an offshore like company or something and be like, yeah, all those uh, occult people were CIA people. It's like, really? It's like, yeah, it's a great way for them to do their MK Ultra stuff. Well, the, the thing about AMOC is that the head of that was very much opposed to, to Kennedy as well, like everyone else was. 
But um, yeah, he he wasn't a Kennedy fan at all. So it's possible he may have uh, he may have given help to the CIA or whoever else in order to carry this out. Now the JFK documents recently. I want to get your thoughts on this. But the Biden saying that he didn't have to disclose them. How do you feel about that, man? I got so pissed when I read that. Yeah, I really don't understand that. Like, I I don't always often agree with Jefferson Morley, but uh, or, or some of the other people involved. But um, it's hard to hard to understand how Biden. Uh, could have voted for the JP Act uh, back when it was uh, brought in, um, and and now do what he's doing here with agreeing to to continue to withhold some records. It's just, I mean, he must he must be aware of how it looks. He must be. I just I can't understand the mindset, and I, and and, I, and that's coming from someone. He doesn't really believe there's any smoking guns in there. No, so. There's just a lot of like operation stuff that I, I guess they might be worried about us knowing about, but I'm actually curious to what that is. I don't trust the term national security after reading the church committee report. There's just, there's way too much I know about the government and what they call national security. Or I'm like, that's not national security. You guys are doing some shady stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, cover all excuse. Isn't it? So it's a convenient way of, Shutting down dissent or you know uh, people asking difficult questions. Oh, national security. Oh, okay, all right, fair enough. Yeah, but plus, I mean, what the government's up to, I mean, if you're talking about doing mind control experiments or something like that, I mean, the fact that that's even talked about in the Sirhan case, and you actually start looking at it and it becomes believable. I mean, because there's evidence there and it's like, you just don't know. I mean, basically you had this person that's on parole. Well, I guess he's on parole now, but going for constantly being in jail for 50 years. I mean, it's a really big issue when you talk about ruining someone's life. I tell you, the um, you brought up his, Sharon's notebook earlier on and, and the fact that it uh, mentions RFK must die, a page a page or page and a half uh, of writing to that effect. Uh, there is a name in there that um, that is mentioned more often than, than RFK is. Um, uh, that's that's a, a young lady called Peggy Osterkamp. Uh, Saran had the hots for her. He was infatuated with her. Was she involved in the case at all? Like, did they interview her? The, what happened was in court, uh, there was Peggy and another young lady that he fancied as well. Uh, his defense team declared that they were going to bring him in to give evidence uh, on the behalf of the defence. When Saran heard that, he stood up and said, I, I'm i guilty. I have had 20 years of forethought of malice in developing this plan to do this crime. I'm guilty. And that was all to stop him, to stop his defence from bringing in those girls. So draw from that whatever you will, but that's what happened. Uh, and as I said, Peggy in, in particular was a um, was mentioned in his book more than more than RFK. I believe that she was the uh, you know what I mean when you're talking about control of someone, you use a, you use carrots and sticks, okay? And I believe she was one of the carrots. That was used to lure him in because one of the things they teach you is that you can get what you want basically with these methods who will teach you okay and what he wanted more than anything was peggy um and i uh, i wouldn't be surprised if the the uh girl in the paper dress wasn't a lookalike Makes sense. I mean, that sounds very similar to what I've learned about the Donald DeFries and the Patty Hearst kidnapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And where was I going with that? Um, yeah, in regard to getting what you want and, and the amount of times he mentioned Peggy, in, in his notebook there is also evidence that he was uh, learning 
uh, have you heard of a guy called Alistair Crowley? I've heard, he's a, it's a big occult guy, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, he he developed all these uh, rituals that were called sex magic rituals. And there's evidence in, note, in, 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 in Saran's notebook that he was learning those sex magic rituals. Um, uh, I can give you some examples if you want, but I have to pull Please it off. Do. I did not know this about him. But no one did. I, 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 uh, there was lots of uh, entries in his book that no one figured out. Well, I figured a couple of them out. In one area, it actually says uh, black magic. Black magic is sex magic, same thing. Um, like the song. Yeah, maybe, but it also says... It repeats the number 44. And Alistair Crowley wrote, wrote a book on sex magic or black magic um, called The Book of Lies. And chapter 44 is uh, instructions on a particular um, ritual. Um, It, it also has, he also uh, drew some star shapes in, in the book, which most people thought were the Star of David uh, associated with Judaism as a, as a sign that, that uh, his hatred for JFK's support of Israel. Okay, that's completely wrong. Those, those stars were actually... Uh, Written under the stars were the words triune and sapphire. Um, and what Sarana drawn were not was was not the star of David. They were they were star sapphires, which were uh, uh, part of Crowley's uh, sex rituals. Um, and then on another page, he's got chapter forty, or he's got written black magic, black magic, 4444. And again, uh, chapter 44 is another sex ritual called The Mass of the Phoenix. Are you looking at the Alistair Crowley book or Sirhan's notebook? No, this is what Sirhan's written in his notebook. How do okay. you, can, and, can you and, share and a screen I, what, you're, what you're looking at? Um, at the bottom of yeah. your screen, there's a share screen button in green. You see it? And you click that. And then it should say something. Does it say to allow you to share a screen? Most disabled participant screen sharing. Hang on. I just I just hit accept on it. So now everyone can do it. So hit that button again and then share screen on whatever you're looking at. It should pop up a bunch of windows. Just click the one you want to share. Is it the, uh, if Sirhan notebook is readable, I've only seen the RFK page that says RFK must die over. Well, this is actually, it's not his notebook that I'm looking at. It. It's a post I, I I wrote about his notebook. Oh, okay. Uh, you can um, share that too and get a little free promotion if you want. Okay, is that showing? Or? No, it's now it is. Yeah. Can you read it? Is it readable? Looks like I'm not seeing it. So it's still loading. It's a black screen right now. There it is. Yep. Sir Hans' phonetic spelling of sapphire strongly suggests he was not teaching himself sex. All right, now you, you scroll down. Yeah, sex magic from the book, but rather he he was writing only what she'd heard spoken to. To put it another way, this evidence of the programming of Sirhan. Underneath the stars, we find the words Shreen and Sapphire. Here, then, is the key Sapphire being the phonetic spelling of Sapphire. What Sirhan had drawn were not stars of David as a manifestation of his enmity to Israel. They were this. Where did you get your information from this from? Well, I, I studied these notes and decided to see if I could decipher them. So, um, were they intelligible or were they unintelligible? Because he, no, no, intelligible, you can, read, you can clearly read what he's written. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, just in, in researching these things, I, I came across uh, the Star Sapphire ritual. And then a few pages later, where he's written Black Magic, Black Magic 44, again, chapter 44 of Crowley's book is, is another sex ritual. 
I think people were misunderstanding those triangles as being stars of David, and they weren't. They were star sapphires from, from Crowley's Book of Lies. Well, that's always where we get the conspiracies that Israel did it. Forty-four Crowley's Book of Lies. Yep, there it is right there. You're gonna have to send me whatever uh, link this is. So I can put it in the episode description so people can click on it as well too. Okay, no worries. And then hit stop sh sharing screen unless you want to share something else. But stop share at the top. And you'll be okay. Um... Yeah, the weird stuff is the occult stuff because, like, even if you look at like Central Intelligence Agency or anything in the government, there's weird occult stuff that's involved in there as well too. It's like everyone's interested in the occult. Uh, if if you read uh, that Patricia um, Johnson book, uh, Marina and Lee, or whatever it's called, you know the one that that. Uh, Patricia McMillan or Johnson wrote in regard to oh, she, Priscilla she Johnson, wrote, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Priscilla, did I say something? Else? Priscilla Johnson, yeah, she was a CIA uh, person, yeah, yeah. But that book has a footnote saying that Lee was fascinated by uh, by that stuff. So, whether that's true or not, I don't know. There's no other sign of it, but I know, I know, uh, I know Ruth Payne was. Because she, some of her friends who were interviewed by the FBI talked about her consulting uh, uh, astrologers and stuff like that. So, we well, that's what the, what I it reached out to you to also talk about was about Ruth Payne because uh, we never did a full deep dive um, through our JFK really episodes about Ruth Payne and kind of like what you've been able to learn about her, which you've done extensive work on. I know you've mentioned to me in off-air conversations about. So, I mean, I'm interested in learning more about, at this point with the JFK stuff, I was just trying to get a good basis of the case, but now I'm looking at more individual characters like Morales and uh, people like Ruth Payne, just so I can understand what people have found out about her and connections and stuff. And obviously I've seen Max Good's documentary as well too, but how'd you, so when it came comes to Ruth Payne, We've mentioned, I think, Michael Payne, some connections with like the helicopter company and his grandparents or something like that. His grandfather, if I'm not mistaken. Well, his grand, he's no, grand, not grandfather. He's um, it's like his great grandfather. Ste ste his stepfather started the company, built a helicopter. Um, that was Arthur Young. Uh, I'm not sure about his grandfather. I'm not sure where that comes into it, but. Um, his own father was was a Trotskyist, um, and very well known in, in that that uh, that particular milieu in, in, uh, on the on the west coast. Um, what I will say is that Ruth Payne. Everyone talks about Ruth Payne's family connections to uh, Intel, and you know the. What you mentioned earlier, the, the military industrial complex. Well, uh, there are some yet to be um, connections there on on Mike Payne's side of the family as well uh, that, that have to be explored. Um, I'm not going to name names at the moment because I, it's still a work in progress and I haven't nailed it completely down. But let me let me say this. There was a, there was a a man on on the um, on the Michael Payne side of the family who absolutely put a lie to the fact that they were uh, humanitarian peace peaceniks. That's not the case. It's certainly not in this case anyway. When it comes to Ruth Payne, I mean, do you believe she was a cutout of the CIA? She's denied CIA connections in her family for a while, but I think people have exposed that her family, her dad, and I think her sister were CIA people. Well, her dad and her sister and her brother-in-law. Uh, her dad and her brother-in-law, that's uh, her sister's husband, uh, John Hoke, uh, they, they were both involved in US AID. I'm not sure whether it's how that's pronounced or whether it's spelled out or, or actually spoken, but you, you say it or 
USA AID, however it's said, um, which was an agency uh, that operated around the world in order to ostensibly uh, provide humanitarian aid to to other to third world countries. Uh, but obviously it was used a lot by the CIA as well as cover for, for whatever they were doing. Um, and that's where that suspicion comes in, because both John Hoke and, and her father were, were both employed by that organisation. Uh, whether they were CIA, I know the father was considered for CIA work, uh, and he probably did do some. Uh, John Hoke, there's an interesting story about John Hoke. He, uh, I'd have to say his name sounds familiar. Yeah, he um, he was actually sacked from his, or allegedly sacked from his USA job for uh, for building a uh, a solar powered boat to help he, to help in his work in South America. Uh, someone in uh, some house committee on the hill. Uh, took exception to the twenty-eight thousand dollar bill to build this boat, and he was gone. He got kicked out. He was another inventor, like a few others in the in, in both sides of the family were. Uh, so he, he did a lot, lot of tinkering, like Mike did. And one of the one of the one of the things he had most interest in was electric cars and uh, solar power. So. Um, there's that aspect of this family that goes unnoticed, and that was, I mean, those were good things, obviously. But there's also this patriotic side of the family that possibly with 2020 uh, hindsight, they stepped over the mark of, of what uh, we consider now to be um, patriotic or, or proper duty or, or or patriotism to the point that it's actually hurting the country or hurting. yeah and, and and not not ethical not um not moral all those sort of things could you give me an example what do you mean unethical well I, well i guess one example is that Ruth Payne uh Said after that she was glad that Oswald got killed, you know. What I mean, and and also had previously refused to help him get legal aid when he'd asked asked for her help. Um, and that's even though she she and Michael were both members of, of uh, the ACLU. You don't think she was involved in the assassination thing, but do you think she was just doing what she thought was her patriotic duty? She's an enigma, I'll, I'll give her that. Okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, there's all sorts of things you can, there's all sorts of things in, in, the, in the evidence that can lead you in all sorts of paths. That's uh, including that she had a thing for Marina. That rumor has been around for a while. And that was what led her to behave or do the things she did. Uh, there's the one that she was CIA. Uh, there's the one that she was babysitting Marina or whatever. All, all of those might have uh, some truth to them or not much truth at all, if any. Uh, but I, I do know that whether knowingly or, or, or unwittingly, she, uh, she betrayed... Uh, I think herself and her religion, and to some extent the country, with some of the things she did in regard to Oswald, this handing over evidence left, right, and centre, um, and especially the fact that some of that evidence she might have manufactured manufactured herself. So you know what I mean, like like the note. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's a, a a lot of things. I don't necessarily think you need her to get on to the level of conspiracy, but she has been the face, I guess, that has been openly, publicly speaking about it and gets attached to the case uh, more often than not. That's why it's interesting because she 
there's a couple things like she said she never talked to marina after that day but then you have secret service accounts of her stopping by to drop off mail and wanting to see marina so it's like there's just a yeah, lot she of did make a couple of attempts yeah. yeah she made a couple of attempts to see her but the uh marina was told warned to stay away from her but there's a misunderstanding about that marina, because of marina's english she thought she was being warned that she was cia and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from that that uh people want to attach roots to the cia it comes from marina's own words that she she said she was warned by the fbi to stay away from her because she was cia that's not what they want that's not what they sold her marina was confused with the acronyms they wanted her to stay away from Ruth because she was ACLU. They didn't want her getting uh, Marina legal help or anyone else legal help. Huh. Are you surprised at the number of connections that are into these types of things? Like so many people back then seemed like they were all CIA informants or something of that sort, but everyone's got some type of back history with something to do with the military industrial complex. What, what, what I'd love to see is the stats on people living in that era and see how many connections the average person had to the FBI, CIA, ONI, Etc. Etc. Like good old Windex, ninety nine point nine percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and compare that to to Lee and see what you can make of that. Do you think you got to under? Well, I'll say, do you think you have an understanding of Lee Harvey Oswald after doing your book as well? I've it's been mentioned a couple times on my show. Um, your book has, and I've said, oh, that's Greg's book. Um, but you dug into an area about like his military career, but earlier before. Um, obviously everyone got to know the Oswald that they know now. So, I mean, do you buy the two Oswald stuff? Do you think you have a better understanding no, of no, Oswald? No, 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 I don't. No. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I would like to think I have an understanding of Oswald. Um, uh, and that's partly because I had a similar, uh, upbringing to him. Um, so there's that sort of empathetic, empathetic thing going there. Um, I empathize because he was 24 years old and had two kids. That's a that's a big issue if you're blacklisting a person in history. Yeah, and, and also, especially in a country like America, where um, you know you, you're stuck doing manual labor at. at, at you know, for a dollar twenty-five an hour. Um, yeah, I. I, uh, I mean, I you bounced for Rob from job to job too. Yeah, yeah, and he was again the single mother comes into it again. So there was a particular type of individual they sought for these for these roles. There's no doubt about that. Now, when it comes People to people that might. People that might have a chip on their shoulder about the life they've had, you know, whatever. When it comes to some of your research that you put into the book, was there an area that you wanted to explore but didn't when it came to um, Oswald's military career? Like, I'm still interested. Obviously, we talked about the venereal disease already. We, we already talked about that in a past episode. But was there an area that you were curious to look into but just didn't couldn't find any evidence on it? Um. No, an area I, I didn't really look into was his ability with the Russian language, but I've since rectified that. Uh, I, I worked on it with a uh, former medic in the Vietnam War uh, over, over there in the States, and uh, it was his idea that we'd do it. I was sceptical that we'd actually be able to prove anything one way or the other, but to my amazement, we actually, uh, I think, pretty well nailed it down as to, as to the fact that Oswald was trained by uh, by the Marines in, in, in Russia, in, in Japan, that happened. And we think that the, we're pretty sure that the uh, brief time he did was cover for him going away and doing deep immersion uh, language study. So he had a good understanding of Russian? 
there's he, he how it works in the military is that you can be tested um, if you've already got a language when you go in to the military. Uh, you can request to learn a language, uh, and before but before they uh, teach you a language, you you they they teach they test you for how how well you like you are likely to learn a new language. In other words, your ability to learn a new language, and that's that sort of testing is sometimes done before you go into the military through uh, through the places like the CAP. Or ROTC, or you know things like that. They'll test you to see if you have a an affinity with with foreign languages. And if you do, and you go into the military, they will then allow you to learn that language, and give you deep immersion in it, and that sets you up for not only a uh, additional pay uh, per month, but also uh, for potential. Uh, Work either in uh, uh, diplomacy or and or the CIA or or, or even the ONI, whatever. Um, now I, I believe that Oswald probably had that test in, in the cap and it showed that he had a capacity to learn uh, languages quickly uh, when he went in uh, to the military and, and went to Japan. That's what, all that bullshit about shooting himself and all that and getting court-martialed and sent to the brig. We actually got in touch with some of the brig guards that were there at the time, and you didn't you didn't do brig time for that on, on that base. That brig was, was purely for drunks coming home late from from uh, from you know a weekend out or whatever. Uh, just a drunk tank, basically. Uh, if you did something serious, you were sent to another base to a much more severe sort of prison type thing. Because he, he, he didn't want to be discharged, didn't he? He didn't want to be discharged. He wanted to stay in the military. No, no, he, he requested a, a, a discharge on the basis of... His uh, mother, right? Being yeah, sick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was the later proposal as well. What had happened, a, a, a jar had allegedly fallen off, off the shelf at work and hit her on the nose, and uh, somehow that pre prevented her from working anymore, which it didn't because she had heaps of jobs after that. Uh, but on the on the basis of that jar hitting her on the nose, he got out of the military. And it was only a matter of uh, probably a month or so till he was going to go, go out anyway, like his time would have been up. So there was some reason why he had to leave the military Quickly, and I believe that was tied in with his mission in, in, in the Soviet Union. There was a, a, a an end date where he had to be there by a certain time, or it was too late. So this phony uh, out early out was was concocted to get him out early and send him over. And then not only that, but he went through he went through Helsinki. Which was the only city in the world where you could get a, a visa to the Soviet Union in one or two days. Now, no one knew that. The only people that knew that was the CIA. But, no. Did um his Russian skills though? When he, from what I remember, did wasn't Ruth Payne teaching him a little bit so he can better communicate with Marina? No, that's okay. No, no if anything. If anything, she was the one that needed further teaching. Because uh, she had students that she taught Russian to, and Oswald hung out with one of the students. Okay, the, the student uh, was a guy called Bill Hookins. Uh If that name isn't familiar to you, Star he Wars. went on to went on to appear in Star Wars among uh, among a number of other movies. Um, Including, and I haven't mentioned this before, uh, but I also know that he played Santa Claus in a Christmas movie once, uh, which was which was written by a friend of mine uh, who's interested in this case, uh, and it was not only starring Bill Hookins, but it was directed by the son of uh, 
the Mexico CIA um, uh, chief at the time in 63, uh, who became a, a, a director. Um, the guy who wrote wrote it, like I said, is a friend of mine, and he he was sort of a bit pissed off when he when he found out uh, about my research about Bill Hookins because he, uh, he he could have he would have pumped him for all sorts of info at the time if he'd have known. But um, yeah, yeah, Bill Bill went to uh, St Mark's School in uh, in Dallas, which was uh, Basically, a, a, a school for the elite in Dallas. Um, he was a fellow student of uh, the guy that was in the uh, uh, you know heap of movies about Texas. Uh, I can't think of his name. When you first looked into this case, were you ever going to expect that there'd be so many connections with so many people, just like there were family members and intelligence or just connections all over the board? No, I, I didn't think about it. I mean, I, I just dive in and what, what I find is what I find. But, I mean, you have to be careful of the of the six degree of separation uh, stuff as well. I mean, it can be meaningful, but it can also be completely misleading. Uh, and there's plenty of books written that prove that. Uh, there's a few out now that uh, that go that route and uh, just that seems to be a, a, a basically books written to find to, to find those connections, mm-hmm. uh, no matter how loose or distant they are. But um, the ones I find, I, I, I have confident, or the ones I talk about, I'm confident have a, have a meaning beyond sheer coincidence. Do you have new research? Like, are you still pulling out new newer things and newer things about the case? It can be Kennedy case, RFK case, be any case. But you mentioned there's no smoking guns in the JFK files, which I agree with you. There's not going to be. But it's when you look at the case, besides getting like more accurate history as much as we possibly can without like somebody giving the official say so, um, new research. I mean, how difficult is that trying to look into something new or another aspect to it? As someone said to me in an email today, actually, um, the, 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 the joy of, of research is that you dive right in and often find something you, you other than what you were looking for, but is twice as important, you know. So, uh, and that that happens quite a bit. And with me, what what tends to happen is I, I file information in the back of my mind, and it might sit there for, for 10, 20 years. And but then I'll come across something and, and wonder if if that impacts or, or connects with that previous information that I couldn't take any further. At the time, and bingo, it quite often does. Um, Bill Hookins is probably an example of that. I mean, I, I knew that I knew the name long before I worked out who he was and what what he uh, and, and his connection to the case via being the guy with Oswald at the at the at the uh, barber shop. Um, is that what you were alluding to? That that question about the barbershop sightings, or no, no, I know about the barbershop stuff. We talked about that before. I'm just, it's just when it comes to new information, obviously new stuff about the case. I mean, you run reopen Kennedy case, um, the forum, and when you hear something like the JFK documents, they're not going to release anymore, or there's not going to be all this. I mean, that's got to be a little bit upsetting. I mean, it's upsetting to me, even though the past, I've only been in this for a year, but just looking through, well, a little bit over a year now. Um, but just looking through everything and then hearing a statement like that, it's a little bit upsetting because I think, you know, once you start diving into it all, you start realizing the importance of why this matters and the, obviously the cultural relevancy. But you realize how big it is that it's probably a house of cards. If you pull this one or solve this one, then you're going to end up tearing down the whole stack. I mean, the MLK assassination, RFK assassination, all these other ones. Yeah, they'll, they'll, I think once you get one open, they'll all start falling over like dominoes. They they can't ignore the others anymore, if you if you see what I mean. They um uh, they can't say okay well we'll open JFK 
but we're not going to look at the others either. You know, it's uh, I think once you open up one, they're all going to be looked at more closely, and and I think that pressure will come from the public. But in, in regard to your question, how hard is it to find new information? It's um, yes, it's still happening. I, I mentioned before about a relative of, of my pain. Uh, that's not completely nailed down yet. So, I, like I said, I, I don't want to release the name in case it turns out to be wrong. But I am pretty certain in my own mind that uh, that I'm right. And this person was connected to uh, to the program in, in World War Two of developing germ warfare. So, you know, what I mean, and that was a like I say, a, a close relative of my pains. Um, that's not the end of it either. I've got new information to roll out. Uh, I've got uh, there's a question, a big question, always been a big question mark over whether Oswald went to Mexico City. Um, That's the biggest one. Yeah, well, I can tell you now he didn't. Yeah. Um, and the allegation was that he was sitting next to a guy called Al Albert Osborne on the bus. Uh, Albert Osborne was a con man. Uh, Travelling preacher, um, and in typical fashion with this case, nothing is as it seems. Even though he was a con man, he was the only honest witness on the bus hmm. because he said the person next to me wasn't Oswald, and he was right; it wasn't. Uh, having said that, I I do know who it was, um, and that's going to be big when I can release that. Uh, but I, I have to sit on that at the moment because. Uh, I'm working on it with someone else. He's uh, he is an academic or a former academic in, in England. Uh, and he's been a tremendous help to me, and we're only halfway through uh, doing a complete background audit on all the players in this. So uh, that'll be something that you can look forward to. Uh, down the track, and yeah. we can release that because this is going to be a, a, a huge thing. Because this guy uh, was connected to the intelligence community. Well, I appreciate that you um not only gave me the time to talk on my show, but also that you're so at least kept back a little bit about releasing stuff a little too soon. Um, at least it shows that you're trying to make sure you got all your eyes dotted and your T's crossed. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's the beauty of uh, working with this guy. Like I said, he's uh, working at he has worked in academia, and he he's forcing me. Even though I thought I was doing a good job of, of uh, doing things properly, I mean, I, I'm not I'm not from his world, and so my my way of doing things wasn't quite. Uh, as rigid or as uh, formal as as this guy is, but he's 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 taking me down that track, and it's been a, a quite an education. And not only that, the, the amount of information we've been able to gather is just astounding. It could be a separate book just in this guy alone. Are, are you examining archive files, or uh, as far as source material? Um, let me tell you, if if you're going to rely solely on CIA documents or FBI documents, you're going to go nowhere. I mean, you'll get some good information, don't get me wrong, but you're not going to have the complete picture. You've got to get outside that box and, and look at other sources. Where where um, a lot of our research has been done in Ancestry.com and in newspaperarchives.com. Um, there is some information in, in the records, but not much. Uh, I'll give you a, an example of, of two of, of how looking at some of the boxes is sometimes a, a brilliant thing to do. There, there was a, at the time Oswald was in Russia, uh, they, they had a student exchange program going. And one of the American students that were at, was over there uh, decided to marry a Russian woman. This was after Oswald married Marina. And um, they're having a, a at the wedding uh, another Russian student who wrote a book about his experiences in Moscow. 
uh, he said that he saw a well-dressed man that was so well, you know, dressed way above what everyone else was dressed. So he decided to go over and chat to him. And it turns out he was from the embassy, the American embassy. And he mentioned to this to this young student that uh, this is the this is the second uh, wedding of a U.S. citizen to a Russian girl. I've been to recently. He said the other the first one was with a guy called Oswald. Well, the interesting thing about that is that uh, the State Department and the embassy always denied that they knew Oswald got married, and yet he's this guy saying he was from the embassy saying he actually attended the wedding. Catching him in another lie. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, this this guy that uh, wrote this book is uh, about, about his experiences in that uh, student exchange program. He worked for a while in the same university as uh, Patricia McMillan, and he was and he knew Patricia McMillan's history. Priscilla of Johnson. Knew, Priscilla Johnson. Yeah, 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 yeah. He knew. He knew that she had written a book about uh, Lee and Marina. So he mentioned to her about this incident at this wedding, not knowing that uh, that the Americans alleged that they didn't know about Oswald getting married. And so he's telling her this, and she said to him, and he wrote this in his book, he, she said to him, for God's sake, don't tell a conspiracy theorist about this on the field day. I'm uh, I'll have to have you back on to talk a little bit more about your new research when you can actually share it. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. But Greg, where can people find your links, man? You give me enough of your time and I appreciate it. I know we didn't have a structure. So what we we're going to be talking about really, I said, we're going to talk about RFK, Ruth Payne, and some maybe other JFK related material, but I appreciate the time. It was always a pleasure seeing you again, man. It's been a little bit too long. So I wanted to have you back on, but where can people find your links, Greg? Uh, it's if people uh, Google um, JFK, uh, reopen the JFK case, they'll find my forum. Um, and I'll send you a few other thing, links, I think, because it's, you know, they, you, they've it's got the slashes. And, I got yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll make sure I link it in the description, man. And like I said, it's pleasure pleasure seeing you again. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank, and stay tuned for our next episode.